Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the calocrine kinin system. Okay, so we're just looking at the acute inflammatory response at the moment. So we're in the process of looking at what happens when you uh, type 1 activate an um, endothelial cell. For instance, with histamine that's been released by mast cells. Okay. Um, we discussed that it causes the endothelial cells to start producing prostacyclin, prostaglandin I2, and also nitric oxide, which both cause relaxation of vascular smooth muscle cells, which leads to vasodilatation of the arterioles, leading to this affected area. Okay, so we now want to look at the next thing that type 1 activation causes, which is that it's going to cause something known as endothelial cell contraction. Okay, so let me get another piece of paper. So, endothelial cell contraction then. Um, basically, if we draw two endothelial cells here, one here, and then the neighbouring one over here, then basically they have, um, well, they have junctions, adhesion junctions between the two of them, okay? So you can see that there is a gap in between them. Now, in normal endothelial uh, linings of blood vessels, we do not want a gap in between the two endothelial cells because we don't want any old uh, molecules from the blood being able to get through this gap and into uh, the interstitial space. Okay, so you want the uh, blood vessels to be tightly sealed, so you have uh, a bunch of protein junctions between these two um, endothelial cells to hold them nice and close together, and also to actually provide a physical occlusion for anything trying to move through the gaps. So let's draw a bigger picture of this here, and have a look at these protein junctions. Okay, so here are the uh, boundaries of the two endothelial cells. And basically what you have is two major types of adhesions between the cells. Okay, so you have a number of proteins involved in uh, junctions known as tight junctions. Okay, so we'll let this represent a tight junction. Okay, and the tight junctions are very close to the lumen, so they're quite apical basically. So they're not just in, they don't just involve one protein, they involve a huge number of proteins. I think they actually involve three separate protein complexes. Okay, so these are a lot of proteins involved in there. Okay, but to simplify it, we'll just denote them as two boxes. Okay, and then this uh, we've got another junction underneath the tight junctions here, known as the adherens junction. So these. This is the adherens junction. Okay, and both of these junctions um, help to keep the two boundaries of the endothelial cells closely opposed to one another. And they also, as I say, provide an actual physical occlusion. Not only do they keep the two boundaries of the endothelial cells close together to try and minimize uh, the uh, size of the gap between them, but also, if something wants to actually move through this gap now, it's going to have to get past these huge, great protein complexes. So these themselves actually provide a physical occlusion. Okay, now in type 1 activated endothelial cells, what will happen is something known as endothelial contraction. Okay, and this basically is when um, the endothelial cells are going to mildly contract. And let me explain what's actually going to happen. So basically, the intracellular domains of the proteins involved in both the tight junctions and the adherens junctions are attached to actin filaments. So remember, actin is a little globular protein which can polymerize into actin filaments. So a single one of these circles is an actin protein, an actin monomer, but then it's going to polymerize together to make a massive great um, strand, basically, known as an actin filament. Okay, and you have these actin filaments attached to the cytoplasmic domain of the proteins involved in both the tight junctions and the adherens junctions. So again, here we'll have an actin filament. Okay, and it's the same for this other endothelial cell over here. So here's another actin filament. Okay, 
And basically what's going to happen is when the endothelial cells become activated by type 1 activation, what's going to happen is you're going to start getting contraction of these actin filaments. So and then I'll just complete the picture by drawing in one more here. Okay, so what's going to happen is this actin filament is going to pull this way, so is this one. Okay, and these two actin filaments here are going to pull this way. So can you see what's going to happen? They're going to pull these tight junctions and these adherens junctions apart because these proteins here are going to get pulled in this way, this direction, and these proteins here are going to get pulled in the opposite direction. So you're going to pull the tight junctions and the adherens junctions apart in these endothelial cells. And that is going to open up a small gap in between these endothelial cells through which uh, fluid in the bloodstream can move, basically. Okay, so this is going to produce increased vascular permeability, okay? And what's going to start happening is that fluid from the blood is going to start moving uh, through these holes in the, between the endothelial cells into the interstitial space, okay? And also, more importantly, you're going to bring proteins that are within the blood um, into the interstitial space with when you bring this fluid, basically. Okay, now, when you bring this additional fluid and proteins that can fit through this gap, and it's important to stress that um, s proteins and fluid can fit through this gap, but whole cells can't fit through this gap. So at the moment, you're just getting fluid and protein coming out. Okay, now when you move this increased fluid and protein into the interstitial space, and then what's going to happen is you're going to get swelling of the um, infected tissue, basically. And that, in Latin again, is tumor. Tumor means swelling. And I think the Latin spelling of tumor is the actual American English spelling of tumor. Okay, um, so this is swelling of the inflamed area as well. Uh, now, what's the point of bringing this fluid and this protein in? What's to get the protein in? And by the way, when you build up this swelling, when you bring this fluid from the bloodstream that would never usually come out of the blood, this is what's known as an inflammatory exudate. So it contains all sorts of proteins that you would never usually get being brought into the tissue. Okay, and these are, and this is known as an inflammatory exudate. Okay, so, um, what sort of proteins are you going to bring in? Well, this is actually going to be extremely important because when we come to discuss the uh, ca calocrine kinin system, the uh, precursors for that pathway are all going to be brought in in here. So we'll look at which proteins are brought in um, in a moment uh, when we look at the calocrine kinin system, but I think I should just outline them at least. Okay, so you're going to bring in the complement proteins. Now, those are going to be involved in attacking the pathogens themselves. Okay, in addition, you're going to bring in the coagulation factors, which are going to kickstart uh, the coagulation cascades. Because as soon as you bring the coagulation factors out of the bloodstream and into the interstitial fluid, you uh, commence the uh, intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascades, uh, which convert uh, fibrin into fibrin and then fibrin is assembled into fibrin strands and you basically form this fibrin meshwork in the uh, infected area and this fibrin meshwork uh, basically surrounds and confines the pathogen and stops it from spreading basically. So the complement will directly attack um, the um, pathogen and the coagulation factors will contain the pathogen. Okay, finally, you'll also bring in uh, the components of the kinin cascade. Okay, so I might call it, um, what should I call these? Um, well, we'll see them later, okay? So I'll just call them the kinin cascade is going to begin. Okay, or the calocrine kinin system. Both of those are the same word. So kinin cascade means the same thing as the calocrine kinin system. And we'll see what the effect of this is in a moment. It's actually a positive feedback loop. It's going to trigger type 1 activation of the endothelial cells even more. Okay, so that's endothelial contraction and the increasing of vascular permeability um, 
to begin um, the formation of an inflammatory exudate. Finally, what's also going to happen is the endothelial cells are going to start recruiting uh, neutrophils, basically, from the blood uh, to the interstitial fluid. So we've formed an inflammatory exudate, which has brought in complement coagulation factors and the kinin cascade components, okay? Uh, now what we want is we want to bring in white blood cells from the bloodstream, and the fancy word for white blood cells is leukocytes. Okay, so we want to bring in leukocytes uh, from the uh, bloodstream into the site of infection so that they can then attack the pathogen. Now, the first type of leukocyte that you bring in is something known as a neutrophil. And these are kind of like your pawns of the immune system. They are something that you have an absolutely huge number of, uh, but which aren't a particularly powerful white blood cell. So, uh, let me draw a little picture of them. Okay, so uh, they have an interesting structure. So they have a multi-lobed nucleus. So they're not multinucleated. They have a single nucleus, uh, but it has multiple lobes. So it has this bizarre structure where it has lobes which are connected by these thin little tubes here. Okay, so this is a nucleus. Uh, now, the number of lobes that a neutrophil nucleus has is not set, okay? So, three is kind of like the archetypal number of lobes that a neutrophil nucleus would have. Uh, but it can vary, it can be four, five, you can even find them with six. Uh, for that reason, they're often known as polymorphs, okay? Which literally means many, that's what poly means, morphs mean shape, so many shaped nuclei. In addition, they're also called polymorphonuclear cells, okay, which is a bit more um, full. So, many shaped nuclear cells, okay, and also they're known as polymorphonucleocytes. Okay, so let me just bring this up. And for that reason, because they can be called polymorphonucleocytes, they can also be abbreviated to PMNs. So polymorphonucleocytes, okay, which can be abbreviated to P for poly, M for morpho, nucleocytes for N, uh, and that's PMNs. Now, um, what's going to happen is that the endothelial cells will put certain molecules on their surface which are going to uh, help uh, tether, well, bind the neutrophils to them. Okay, so let's show this. So, if we have an endothelial cell here, okay, then uh, the endothelial cell, upon type 1 activation, will put two molecules on its surface which are involved in uh, the recruitment of neutrophils. So, one of them is going to be P-selectin, okay? And I want to stress that these molecules do not take long to get. Uh, firstly, one is a lipid molecule, and P-selectin is, is a protein, but it's um, a protein that you already have present. So you don't need to synthesize it from scratch, okay? So uh, the endothelial cells, all endothelial cells of your body, have P-selectin stored in little vesicles within them, okay? So let me just cover this in. So here is P-selectin stored in a vesicle. So all over your body where the endothelial cells are not activated, P-selectin is stored in vesicles within these endothelial cells. And these vesicles have a very special name. They're known as viable pallade bodies, okay, or WPBs for short, viable pallade bodies, okay. Um, and basically, when um, the endothelial cell undergoes type 1 activation, what happens is the viable pallade bodies will fuse with the apical membrane of the endothelial cell, and therefore P-selectin will be uh, present on the endothelial cell apical membrane. So you don't have to synthesize it, basically, which is why type 1 activation is so quick, and type 2 activation takes so much longer. Okay, the other molecule that you're going to put on your surface is something known as platelet activating factor, and this will actually be within the phospholipid bilayer, and this is a lipid molecule uh, which is very quick to make, basically. It will be made in the uh, type 1 activated endothelial cells, but it's very quick to make. 
So this is platelet activating factor. Okay, and this is often abbreviated to PAF for short, P-A-F. Okay, so um, end, uh, sorry, neutrophils will have receptors for both of these molecules, uh, and this will allow them to adhere to the uh, type 1 activated endothelial cells. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.